All right, so in this video, we're going to look at taking our uh, little network here that we've built, uh, small but surprisingly powerful, and we're going to create a sort of digital asset wrapper HDA around uh, different parts of this uh, so that uh, it's sort of a nice modular system uh, and something that we can use inside of a game engine, for example, Unreal. So I try really hard when working on uh, systems now to sort of think about how I'm going to break them up into different HDAs ahead of time. I'm not a fan of the kind of monolithic HDAs that sort of do everything. I don't like it because uh, they get more complex, they get a little bit more confusing, and difficult to manage and maintain. But most importantly uh, for me, um, they often it often means you're doing redundant work. So what do I mean by that? Well. When we're doing this pathfinding, one of the sort of the, cre the key aspects that's uh, really important to me is that when I click somewhere, I want the paths to appear pretty much instantly. Um, interestingly, it looks like I may have broken my setup uh, somehow. Oh no, there we go, it's all good. Um, so yeah, I want my paths to sort of appear instantly as I click. And I want this behavior to exist not just inside of Houdini, but also wherever I, I end up taking the tool. And the reason this runs so fast inside of Houdini is because the only thing that needs to cook right now, uh, apart from, well, yeah, is, is this kind of curve, everything that's sort of happening to those curves. So the resampling, the projecting to the terrain, uh, sort of creating those lists uh, with the uh, with the names, of the, with the orders of the points, and then the actual pathfinding uh, algorithm itself. This visualization stuff doesn't count because we're not going to actually use that uh, for the end result in any way. All of this stuff over here on the left-hand side doesn't need to be recooked every time I make a modification on this side. Uh, what we can basically say is that this is sort of cached. Um, it's been predefined. Uh, so I want that to sort of predefined costs and all of that sort of stuff sort of to be encapsulated uh, by the way that I build this tool as well. Um, I don't want to be every single time I'm in Unreal and I draw a curve, I don't want to have to reevaluate or regenerate the costs, the terrain, the remeshing, all that kind of stuff, because that's going to be doing sort of redundant work. Similarly, if I was to put down um, another uh, sort of thing off to the side over here uh, with a different set of curve inputs like so, um, we, we actually don't need, you know, to... Um, did that not work? Why is that not working? That oh, probably because I flew to the wrong place. Let's have a quick little look. What's the error? No start points. Is it because I didn't draw any curves? Well, let's just try that again. Draw some curves. Make sure I'm previewing the terrain. Draw my curves. Da, da, da. There we go. So what this means is as well that uh, I can sort of have multiple of these HDAs, um, which are the most lightweight version uh, possible. Uh, of sort of doing the least work possible is what I'm trying to say, uh, because they're actually relying on the same sort of terrain input. So that's another sort of useful thing for splitting this up is we don't end up recomputing uh, all of the sort of the terrain mesh inside of each pathfinding node. So that gives me a clue already about how I want to break this thing up. Uh, we know that we want the curves to be user defined. So they're gonna be coming in from outside of the network, but then everything on this side that processes those input curves as they need to be processed for the fine choice path algorithm, algorithm needs to be included. Uh, then we have our um, sort of height field preparation stuff uh, and our user defined uh, costs. So that's what I'm going to do over here. Everything which is based around sort of setting up those costs on the landscape is going to be its own separate block, uh, as well as dealing, you know, with the creation of the landscape itself. Uh, so let's actually even go ahead and maybe pull the raw height field out of there too. Okay. So. Now you see, even just doing that is causing it to recook. Great. Uh, okay, so I'm going to block, put a comment block around this and call this height field input. I'm going to go around uh, this and we're going to go ahead and do sort of generate costs masks slash masks. And then uh, prepare, so actually let's just call this prepare height field for pathfinding, it's a bit more of a descriptive name. Uh, we've got our user input, so user input or control curves, okay? And then uh, finally, we've got our visualize output, which we'll bring away down here. And we finally have our uh, sort of beating heart of our pathfinding system, so we'll call this terrain pathfinding, okay? 
Uh, so what have we kept inside of our terrain pathfinding? What is going to comprise our terrain pathfinding HDA? Well, we've got our sort of costs uh, accum accumulation function um, over there. We've got uh, sort of our spline preparation. Um, so spline preparation. And then we've also got, uh, what's this one down here? Oh, yeah, this is generate point lists. There we go. And finally, we have kind of the core thing, which is the function as path. Get rid of this now. So, okay. We now know how we're going to break apart our system. Uh, we've got our inputs. We've got uh, one HDA, which is going to be caring about sort of preparing our terrain. And then we've got another, which is doing the pathfinding. So let's let's have a look at this one first of all. Let's grab all of these uh, all of these nodes and sort of right click, go actions and collapse to subnet. Okay. Now <laughs> it's done a sort of shoddy job of uh, correctly sort of identifying the order of these inputs. Uh, it sort of seems a bit chaotic. So let's just go ahead and slice all of these. And what we want is we definitely want the height field uh, to be coming in on the left. And then we want our user inputs to be coming in on the right. Now this, I'm just going to cancel that cook because everything is going to be wired up wrong inside of here. So we've got, again, height field on the left. And then we've got our user inputs coming in on the right. And remember, we're projecting our curve to the terrain. So this actually needs to come over here too. And let's keep things nice and uh, nice and tidy inside of here to the best of our ability. Uh, so let's just go and uh, create a null. And we'll call this in curves. Create another null, call this in mesh, because we're, at the end of the day, we're actually pathfinding on a mesh, not a height field. And then we're going to call this for the output out curves output and then we're going to call this yeah output curves okay got generate point lists we've got our cost accumulation function we don't need an output for that and we're looking pretty good everything's wired in everything cooks correctly so we're looking we're looking pretty good we don't need those so now that we've uh, sort of broken up those two. Uh, let's go uh, up here as well. And we'll collapse uh, this preparation of the height field mesh into a nav navigation mesh. And we'll say collapse subnet. Okay, and same as we did with the, uh, let's actually go ahead and name this, we'll call this pathfinding or terrain pathfinding. We'll go and call this uh, prepare pathfinding mesh. You can see it's really annoying every single time we make a modification, we have to remesh that height field, which is what I'm looking to avoid by splitting these things up. And with this one, because I'm not sort of settled on exactly how this is going to be laid out right now, let's just leave it as is. And uh, we can uh, also just have a little visualize of those costs, leave that outside. We may want to move this visualization inside of the, 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 the HDA. All right, so that's looking pretty good. This is something like what our a, a final network will, will look like using these tools. And let's now right click our sub network that we created, the pathfinding one, and we're gonna go and click create digital asset. Okay, so I'm gonna call, well, I think I've, this is actually pretty good already, but I'm gonna call this Pegasus Terrain Pathfinding. And uh, I'm going to go and save this to a tab called Pegasus. And yeah, I'm going to add an author namespace. We're going to call this Pegasus 2. So not Pegasus 2, but Pegasus as well. So that's the author now. Pegasus, Pegasus terrain pathfinding, Pegasus, Pegasus. Um, we're going to add a version because why not? And then I'm going to go ahead and save this into Pegasus 2024, Houdini, library, OTLs. And you can see I've already got some other versions of this pathfinding. Um, this is this is the most kind of up to date one. So I'm going to call this uh, just Pegasus dot Pegasus Terrain Pathfinding, and we're going to get rid of the version number. So if I save more versions of this uh, node, I'm just going to save them inside of the same package, the same HDA package, rather than having lots of files here. I'll go ahead and hit accept, and then. Uh, this all looks good. You can see that it's gonna be saved in the correct location. We can see that the name is set up correctly, the label and the tab submenu, so I can hit create. 
Okay, and a good sign is that this hasn't broken. Uh, we're still getting our output paths. And we've gone straight into the edit operator type properties window. And just because I like doing this, uh, I'm gonna go and right click on the shortest path node. And I'm gonna go and copy the path to the icon. And I'm gonna put that same icon on my terrain pathfinding. So there we go. We're now using the same icon as the uh, pathfinder node, the sh shortest path node, sorry. And Pegasus Terrain Pathfinding is a good name. I'm happy with that. I'm going to go and name my inputs for, for just for hygiene's sake. So we're going to call this Navigation Mesh. We're going to call this uh, User Curves. And we're going to call this Output Paths. Then if we go to the Parameters window. I'm going to open up the tool. And we're going to promote all of these parameters uh, to, the, uh, to the top level. Uh, so I think by default, we're going to set uh, some, some costs. Um, let's go and put the ascent and the descent cost to one and one. And then let's just go and drag these in one by one. There may be a quicker way to do this. Okay, there we go. We have our basic costs. Now, you may have noticed that we were having to multiply all of these numbers by very high numbers. Uh, so what I'm gonna do actually is I'm just going to put in uh, one more multiply, one more multiplier. So we're gonna say times CHF global cost multiplier. Okay, like so. We're going to put that to 100 and uh, leave that inside of the cost accumulation. So we're not gonna promote that one. And that just means that we can work with more reasonable slider value ranges. Okay. And let's have a quick little test that everything's working as it should. Okay, we can see that things are modifying, so I, but it's still requiring some pretty high numbers. I'm gonna go in and we're just gonna multiply that once more by a thousand. Is that even working? Uh, times global cost multiplier. Doesn't seem to be having any effect. Oh, it's because it's only multiplying the very last one. That's my mistake there. So let's just make sure that we're putting, I don't really want to put this in braces. So we're just going to do this instead. So now we're just times equals a global cost multiplier. Need to make sure I end that line correctly. Okay, and now what we should see is that we have slightly more reasonable value ranges. If we drag the ascent cost, we're gonna see things changing uh, sort of, you know, when we use these lower values, which is what we want. Okay, one, 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 good stuff. All right, so is there anything else that we're missing? Um, I mean, this could always be improved, but I think for the time being, this is looking pretty good. Um, and there's nothing that needs to be specified over here on the resample or the ray for the time being. And that's, so I think that's, that's pretty much it. Um, at this stage though, I'm going to show you something um, pretty neat. Um, so if you remember before, we did do a sort of, uh, we generated loads of paths going to one point. So let's wire those in again. Um, just scattering on the terrain. There you go. So we're generating a lot of points here. And um, let's just turn off that viz and just look at the output paths. I'm going to turn up the number of scatter points. And you can see that we can go pretty high already. But as we approach really high numbers, it's going to start taking a little while to think. Yeah, I'm actually gonna exit out there because that was taking too long. Let's stick with 2000. Okay, so naturally, as we do more paths, it's going to take longer. Um, but there's a little trick that I learned, um, which is related to the fact that we are now actually explicitly storing uh, the neighbor points. There you go. For each point, we know exactly which neighbors we're going to. Um, so, you know, without that, when we're just having a flat cost per point, we end up in a situation where if I just go and uh, let's have a look at the, let's actually, let, let's just 
do this. Ooh, uh, bah -bah. okay, I don't want to focus on any of this stuff. Sorry, so there we go. I just want to see this mesh. So um, usually the pathfinding algorithm, if we don't set up the explicit neighbors array, it, it knows sort of how it can travel based off of the actual primitives connecting one point to another. But because we're explicitly storing the neighbors that it can travel to, we no longer need these edges. And what that means is the fact that we still have them, we're not only considering the explicitly defined neighbors that we're traveling to, we're actually also considering all of these edges uh, unnecessarily uh, inside of our pathfinding algorithm. Well, what, does that, what does that even mean? Well, what it means is that we can remove, uh, we can actually remove the geometry and just run this fine shooters path algorithm on only the points. So let's have a look at what that would look like. If we go ahead and click, put down an add node and then delete geometry, but keep the points. We can see that we we actually get the pathfinding uh, result, uh, even though we're only traversing across this uh, this point, this set of points. You see, there's actually no um, there's actually I mean, I actually can see still some edges here. So why why is that? Um, there we go. It's because I was still previewing something outside. So you can see that instead of actually doing the pathfinding across the edge network like we were doing here. Now the pathfinding algorithm only requires this set of point inputs. And this is really useful um, because it means that the find shortest path algorithm here uh, basically has less work to do. And we can prove that if we go ahead and press, I pressed Alt Y to bring up the performance monitor. If we go ahead and measure the cost of running it just on the, uh, the edge network without removing the points, it takes uh, 2.852 seconds, 2.852. So let's just write that down. 2.852. And then if we do actually uh, remove the points, you can see that it takes 2.653. <laughs> so it's so a small difference, uh, but uh, every little helps. Uh, so yeah, that's why I removed those points. And this may be more noticeable as you increase the size of, the, of your networks, increase the number of edges, increase the resolution of the terrain. Okay remove edges and then let's go back to our user controlled curve inputs save the node match the current definition and then there we have it we have our first uh, digital asset that we've created so in the next video we're going to switch over to using the pegasus terrain so the actual uh, hype field that uh, ian produced in his series and we're going to look at moving these tools uh, over into Unreal and sort of setting up a nice interactive uh, curve drawing pathfinding tool over inside of Unreal.